Welcome to the iPad Podcast, a weekly podcast from Mac's Future. Okay, welcome to the iPad Podcast. This is Lex at Mac's Future, and this is episode 77 of the iPad Podcast, and it's coming out on Sunday, October 23rd. 2011 and um well it's just another interesting week in ipad news apps and ipad related stuff remember this is a chit chat free podcast and we're going to be talking about ipad stuff here we go okay everybody i want to remind everyone that um the first thing i want to remind everyone is that tomorrow the steve jobs biography is coming out by Walter Isaacson, and he's a famous biographer, and Steve Jobs totally cooperated with him, uh, you know, especially in the last few years, and even right up till the time he died. So this is this could be like the definitive biography on Steve Jobs. There's been other books written on Apple and on Steve Jobs, but this is the really the big one. And right now you can pre-order it in iBooks or on iTunes. Um, the digital version on iBooks costs sixteen dollars, I think, and ninety-five cents. The hardcover is also coming out tomorrow. Now, I did a boo boo, which is I originally pre-ordered the digital version of the Steve Jobs biography for the Kindle for the Kindle app on the iPad through Amazon and. Who did I read? I think I read uh, Don McAllister of Screencast Online on Twitter, and he he had done the same thing, but he canceled his Amazon order and then ordered it through iBook. And I did the same thing today. I realized, what am I doing? You know, how can I buy the Steve Jobs digital biography on the Amazon Kindle app and not on iBook? So you know, I mean, that would be sort of blasphemy for Steve. Um, the same price. So anyways, you should probably buy it through iBooks or get the hardcover in stores. So this, you know, this is going to be a really cool biography. Now I'm going to first read it on the iPad. I like reading books on the iPad iBook app. And then I might get the, the paper copy of it. So, you know, you can pre-order it right now if you're listening um, the evening of uh, October 23rd again it's going to come out October 24th tomorrow Monday now before I start recording this podcast tonight I watched 60 minutes CBS 60 minutes show because Walter Isaacson the biographer of the Steve Jobs biography that's coming out uh, was featured on 60 Minutes. His book is coming out by on Simon & Schuster, which CBS owns. And it was a really interesting interview. Some things were revealed that are in the book. And um, I have a link to CBS News' website where there's a lot of content on Steve Jobs and the biography. And, you know... It's it's very interesting. Already a lot of things have come out about uh, the biography that give us insights into various things. One insight that relates to the iPad is that when it came out in early '09, I don't know if you recall, but a lot of the tech press and reviewers were highly critical of the iPad when it first came out. They said, oh... You know, it doesn't have flash. You know, it's limited in this respect or that respect. And Steve Jobs confided in his um, in his um, biographer, Walter Jacobson at the time, according to Walter Jacobson, that uh, he was somewhat, um, you know, depressed by the reaction. And uh, I guess sad, saddened by the reaction because he, he obviously, you know, really put so much into the concept of the iPad. So that's one thing that, um, you know, comes out. And it must have been hard for Steve, if you think about it, because the iPad is so futuristic. I remember when the rumors were coming out of the iPad, people were saying, oh, the name iPad's ridiculous. 
that it reminds people of some sort of sanitary uh, woman's, um, you know, a woman's device of some sort or sanitary care for a woman. And people were poking fun of it. And now, I mean, we're so used to the name iPad. It totally makes sense. Um, and we're so used to it. We don't, you know, we envision this tablet device. So, anyways, I I um I think you should check out CBS's website. I have the link on my website, and um, you know it's pretty pretty good. There's a lot of content there if you didn't see the 60 Minutes um, show. Now, also on CBS's website um, is a link to the segment that immediately followed. 60 Minutes piece on Walter Isaacson and his book on Steve Jobs. And it was basically focusing on the iPad. In specific, it was focusing on how the iPad has been revolutionary for helping uh, children in particular who are autistic and the people who help the children who are autistic. And this was truly a um, moving piece. Um... And basically it's saying that, look, you know, before it was, you know, a lot of kids who are severely artistic, it's hard for them to communicate with people. It's hard for them to say what they want. And there are these great apps that have come out for autism. And if you have anybody who's autistic, you should consider getting an iPad. And the website has um, a link to, you know, uh, apps for autism that were featured in the um, in the show and and a lot of video content and basically you know if there is one thing that the iPad has done it's really helped so many people who are handicapped people who can't communicate people who have difficulty speaking people who have difficulty learning and um, I don't know it was a, it was it was very very moving it was very very moving um watching this um segment on 60 minutes and you know i think that 60 minutes piece alone is going to sell a lot of ipad apps um so anyways you should check it out both links are very very um you know, interesting on 60 Minutes. One link is about Steve Jobs, and the other one is about apps for autism and uh, communicating with kids who are autistic using the iPad. Okay, so one of the things that happened this week is that Apple came a little closer to releasing iTunes Match to the masses. Now, what is iTunes Match? Now, Apple has announced previously iTunes Match as their sort of cloud service for, um, you know, music, streaming music or downloading music to compete with Amazon and Google. And they're getting closer to releasing it. Basically, um, you can run it on any iOS device right now. However, you first need to download the developer's version if you're part of the developer's um, program uh, that Apple has for iOS. You can download iTunes on your Mac or Windows computer, but a certain special version of iTunes that allows you to sign up for iTunes Match, which costs $24.99 a year. And it's essentially like a button in your iTunes application on your computer. And once you sign up, you can then activate it on your iPad iPad 1 or iPad 2 or iPhone or iPhone 4S and it's essentially you'll you'll see now under music in your iOS device whether it's your iPad if you go into settings music at the top it'll say uh, iTunes match and if you click it on it'll prompt you to log in but you can't log in unless you've already activated it on your computer so what is iTunes match well, here's how Apple describes it. It says, if you want the benefits of iTunes in the cloud for music you haven't purchased from iTunes, iTunes Match is the perfect solution. It's built right into iTunes app on your Mac or PC, 
and the music app on your iOS device devices and it lets you store your entire collection including music you've imported from CDs or purchased somewhere other than iTunes for just $24.99 a year and here's how it works iTunes determines which songs in your collection are available in, in the iTunes store. Any music with a match is automatically added to your iCloud library. Since there are more than 20 million songs in the iTunes store, most of your music is probably already in the cloud. All you have to do is upload is, upload is what iTunes can't match, which is much faster than starting from scratch. Once your music is in the cloud, you can stream and store it on any of your devices even better all the music in iTunes match uh, matches plays back from iCloud at 256 kilobyte uh, per second AAC DRM free quality even if your original copy was lower qu quality so here's the thing I am um, I activated it and I, I kind of like it a lot, and I like it a lot better than Google Music or even Amazon, and here's why. Well, first of all, let me tell you what trouble I had it initially. I have like 35,000 songs in my iTunes library, and when I first tried to sign up, I couldn't sign up because Apple gave me a window in iTunes that said, you have over 25,000 songs so you can't sign up for iTunes match now I hope Apple changes this when it releases iTunes match for everybody because there might be a lot of people who have more than 25,000 uh, songs so I did I did a little bit of a hack um, what I did was I created a duplicate version I created a separate iTunes library and you can do that uh, here's what you do when you when you close out of, out of iTunes and relaunch iTunes by holding down the option key on a Mac that'll prompt you to um, open another or create another iTunes library so I did that and then uh, I launched that new iTunes library which was blank it had nothing in it and then I just added uh, into iTunes, my new iTunes, I added uh, all the songs, um, all the folders with the songs from my old iTunes library, but without mu moving the music files. And you can do that. Actually, if you're looking at this um, tutorial, I'm going to go into Preferences. It, one thing you want to do is you want to go into iTunes on your Mac into Preferences, and where it says copy files go to advanced under advanced preferences and where it says copy files to iTunes media folder when adding to library uncheck that and um, I also unchecked keep iTunes media folder organized I did that because I want I don't want to have duplicate media so I was happy to just use the media that was in my other iTunes library for uh, my let's say my, I called it my iTunes match library now what I did is I didn't add all the music at once I first added like um, all the folders from C to J that gave me something like about 7,000 um, songs and because there was 7,000 songs in my new library I was able to activate iTunes match I just clicked on the button on the left and I I paid for a $25 a year membership and because I had less than 25,000 songs I could start iTunes match and what it was it it works very well it basically it very quickly you know scans the thousands of songs that you have and determines what matches with what Apple has in its store online and boom those those songs were immediately available for me on my iOS devices and so I then used the same login on the iPad and the iPhone 4s and it says you know you, when you log in do you want to re replace the, the library that you have on your 
iPhone or iPad and you say yes. And the thing is, um, it's, it basically, it's there and you see all your music in your music app on your iPad or iPhone. And you can actually, though, distinguish between the music that's actually on your iPad or iPhone and the music that's in the cloud. Now what's interesting was when I did this, I already had some music on the iPad, but when I activated the iPad um, iTunes Match feature, it didn't delete the music I had on the, on the iPad. It counted it um, as being there and as part of this whole iTunes Match thing. So I didn't have to re-download the music I already had on my iPad. And in this music settings of your iPad or iPhone, you can there's a toggle uh, on, on, under the i i match iTunes match but um, toggle that says, do you want to just see the music that you have on your iPad or iPhone, or do you also want to see the music that's in the cloud? And if you click and I want to see also the music in the cloud, you see obviously a lot of tracks. And the ones that are in the cloud have a little cloud next to the tracks on your music app. And the ones that are actually on your hard drive don't uh, of your I iPad or iPhone do not have the cloud. And basically, if you have a good internet connection, you can play the music on your um, that's in your iTunes match online. And it, I, th I think it's streaming to your iPad or iPhone because I noticed that um, uh, after I played it, it wasn't then on my device. Um, so here's a little tip. Um, you know, I have, like I said, I had like 35,000 songs. So I kept adding more and more folders. The more, you know, once I created this iTunes match library, I, I, I added more and more folders of music from uh, the actual digital content that was in my other iTunes library. And what I noticed was there, you know, there was a subset that were not matched. And the way iTunes Match works is if it's not matched, it'll upload it to your account online. But I decided, I decided to just go with what's matched in that account. So I sort of removed from the library iTunes match whatever wasn't matched so now I have two iTunes iTunes libraries one that's called iTunes match and one that's called iTunes and you don't have to do it this way if you have I don't know less than 25,000 songs you can just use your iTunes account but here's the, the thing once you um, you can close out of your duplicate iTunes match library that you use to create your iTunes match account and if you launch your old iTunes account where you didn't like log into iTunes Match, it, you still have your iTunes Match online. So my workflow is going to be that I'm just going to, um, you know, shut down. I'm not going to launch anymore my iTunes Match library on my computer. Keep it closed, but all that music's available online. And I'm going to use my old iTunes library that has everything on my computer. It sounds a little complicated, but this way I have a library that's devoted to iTunes Match and one that's devoted to everything. Because for example, I also have, you know, movies and podcasts and voice memos and all sorts of stuff on my iTunes library. And I just want to sort of have a clean library that's devoted to iTunes Match. So this should be rolling out to everybody in the coming weeks, a lot of people think. And um, I think it's a great, a great utility for both the iPad and the iPhone. So when it comes out, check it out. Okay, let's get to some other iPad-related news. And uh, GigaOM, which is a very well-respected tech website, came out with an article that was republished on Bloomberg Business Week by Daryl Etherington. And I kind of agree with everything that Daryl Etherington says. His article was entitled, Why a Smaller iPad Mini Has a Place in Apple's Future. And he basically, his article starts off, you know, 
saying that there had been reports uh, as early as, well, as recently as October 18th, that Apple has ordered 7.85 inch text test displays for a possible iPad mini to come with the next big hardware refresh. And remember the late Steve Jobs, he was very much against the idea of a smaller iPad. He, He said you'd have to He'd, you'd have to uh, sand down your fingers to be smaller. But Earthington makes some good points as to why I, I also agree that an, uh, a mini iPad, you know, let's say in the range of seven inches is going to come out. And here's the points that he makes, which totally makes sense. He says that the iPod Touch is languishing. It wasn't updated along with the iPhone 4S to have the A5 processor or the better camera. And, um, you know, the iPod Touch, I mean, it's selling well, but it's languishing. And, you know, what I noticed is Apple dropped the price of the iPod Touch. I I think it was like $220 for the smallest one, which has only 8 gigabytes. And it's now $199, which is the same price as the Kindle Fire, which is going to come out soon. Uh, Another point that he makes is that Apple can diversify the tablet category. Um, And um, he says this, he says, the tablet is still in its infancy, but Apple has already shown that its interpretation of the device can threaten long-established products like notebook PCs and help Apple take a lead position in how computing will look 10 years from now. Uh, And he goes on to say, the uh, uh, upheaval Apple spearheaded means we'll soon think about tablets as a different sort of category of device from others. I believe it will be more like PCs, where people often have both desktops and notebooks to suit different purposes. Um, And then he goes on to say, look, the Kindle Fire demonstrates an interest well, but the Kindle Fire hasn't been sold yet. I guess it's been pre-sold. Um, but look, I think I think that people want a, a, a tablet device that's in between the size of the iPod Touch and the iPad because it'll just be much lighter and easier to use in a highly mobile situation. Like I noticed... I noticed on the New York subways, there's a lot of people using the six or seven inch Kindle um, and just holding it with one hand. So you can make a seven inch iPad will be much, much lighter. And like I said previously, I think um, Apple's only challenge with a seven inch iPad is price. How is it going to price it where the iPod Touch is $200? and the smallest iPad is $500. So maybe Apple will price it at, um, at, let's say, an 8 gigabyte 7 inch iPad. Um, iPad, maybe Apple will sell it for $325. And that way the iPad, the full version, is $500. Um, But I, I think one reason Apple may do it is, remember the Remember the um, iPod, the iPod's 10 years old, but the iPod first came out, there was one iPod that was, you know, $500 and five gigabytes. And then we had, you know, uh, the iPod Shuffle, the iPod Mini, the iPod Classic. So I think there's room for another iPad size. So um, Daryl, Etherington, I think, is right, and I bet you in the coming year Apple is going to do that. At the very least, damage Amazon, which is coming out with the Kindle Fire, which is a sort of Android version of uh, the Kindle. Well, the iPhone 4S is out, and Apple already, or uh, already there are rumors about the iPad 3. And one rumor, which I saw on SlashGear.com, that picks up on a uh, rumor from a website called Makatakara, a reliable Asian source, 
um, is saying that Apple will release the next generation tablet about a year after the iPad 2. Well, to that I say, duh, of course it's going to be about a year after the iPad 2, making a debut no earlier than March 2012. And there are some leaked shots of the alleged iPad 3 components, and it appears that Apple will equip the new iPad with a smaller dock connector. Um, so, you know, I don't know, it's hard for me to tell in this picture how much smaller the dock, dock connector is. I mean, it, um, it doesn't look that different than the current dock connector. Other rumors are that it's going to have a high resolution retina display. Um, you know, that's going to be a function of price if Apple can get such displays. So I think starting now until the release of the iPad 3, we're going to have weekly rumors from all sorts of sources as to the iPad 3, what it's going to look like, you know, what components there's going to be, all sorts of speculation. And when it finally does come out, there are going to be people who are going to be wildly disappointed because the crazy, the crazy rumors about, you know, this or that didn't come true. And they're going to miss the key parts of the iPad 3. Uh, are there going to be, you know, key upgrades going on? Obviously, one upgrade, I'm sure, in the iPad 3 is going to be better processor. Apple always improves the processor. And there's probably going to be a better camera. And maybe there'll be more storage. Maybe we'll have 128 gigabytes of storage in the largest version of the iPad. But... I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be, you know, fun having a new iPad in coming around in the spring. Okay, this week saw one of the weirdest security uh, leaks re uh, identified. And by weirdest, I mean something involving the iPad 2. And uh, I read about this on PCWorld.com's website. The author was Elizabeth Fish. She had an article entitled, iPad 2 Smart Cover Exposes Security Flaw. Feels kind of stupid now. And um, she basically says, you know, you know, you can lock your, um, your, um, you know, your iPad with a code so that you need a code to, to um, log in. Well, you know, Apparently, uh, you can also shut down the screen, obviously, by just closing your iPad 2's cover, the smart cover. And it says here, lift the cover off the screen and your iPad wakes right up. Unfortunately, members of the German forum, forum App, App, Appfell Talk discovered a bug in how iOS handles the smart cover that makes it possible to bypass iPad's passcode screen. And she says, to trigger this glitch, hold down the power button and wait for the iPad to ask to power off. When that happens, place the smart cover over the tablet. Next, take the cover off again, cancel the power down, and you're in. No password required. And it says the bug generally seems to affect iPads running iOS 5, but 9 to 5 Mac has also discovered that the issue is present on some that are still running iOS 4.3. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so basically, you shut down. There's a, you know, there's a, um, there's a video that shows how it's done, and let's let's uh, take a look at the video. But basically, you shut down the. I guess you press down the iPad too, like you're 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 shutting it off and <coughs> let's see what happens. Okay, so he's like shutting down the iPad too and just before it's going down um you put the smart cover and then you open the smart cover Oh, oh, he's just showing the, uh, like you're powering down. Huh. Well, basically, 
you power it down like you're and then press cancel and use the smart cover and you're in and you bypass the the passcode so it is it is a bug i mean i don't use a passcode with my ipad but if i guess if you did um and people knew about the smart cover trick to get into your ipad it would be a compromise so look i'm sure apple's going to release an update to iOS 5 that um, does away with this bug in the uh, smart cover and the passcode lock. But it is a very clever hack. Now one thing that I'm a little frustrated by is that there currently really isn't a jailbreak for the iPad 2 running iOS 5. And there's a link I have on my blog to a website called iosnova.com which has an interesting article on October 22nd entitled When Will iOS 5 iPad 2 Be Jailbroken? And he basically does an overview of you know where the jailbreaking is, what's going on with the different jailbreak teams. And it seems that the iPad 2 along with the iPhone 4S has a little hardware difference in it than the prior iPhones and the iPads that are a particular challenge to the different jailbreak teams. And you may ask, why do I want to jailbreak my iPad 2? And to a large extent, you know, uh, the iOS 5 uh, operating system has addressed a lot of the things that you would want in, in the iPad and that you would, you know, that previously might want in a jailbreak app. For example, we now have, have wireless mirroring uh, you, we have also hardware mirroring uh, of whatever's on the iPad to to uh, what's connected to it. And we have tab browsing uh, in Safari. We have the notification, um, you know, overview thing that drops down. So what could be, what, what you know, why do I need to jailbreak? Well, one reason I want to jailbreak the iPad 2 is... I like to do screen recordings of the different apps and right now it's particularly challenging to do a screen recording. The only two ways to do it without a jailbreak are to, you know, shoot a video of your iPad uh, and that's a little cumbersome. You got to set up the video and aim the camera and hopefully there's no reflection. The other way is the iPad 2 can send a mirror of what's on it through the HDMI out. But if you want to capture that HDMI out connection and bring it into a computer to screen record, well, you got to get like these expensive boxes um, that capture and convert HDMI, you know, sources into video on a Macintosh. And the, the cheapest solution was the jailbreak solution because I was using a great... Um, jailbreak app called display recorder by ryan petrick and hopefully he'll upgrade it to work with ios 5 and with that jailbreak app i could record screen record on my ipad 2 and it would even give me sort of finger uh it would there'd be these dots where my fingers are so you could sort of see the touch you know how the touch worked on different apps the only thing that that screen recording didn't have was sound capture, but it also allowed you to uh, mirror your iPad uh, screen on a, on, a, on a web browser on a computer that was in the same Wi-Fi you know, network as the iPad. And so my workflow there was to capture the screen recording on the browser and if I needed sound, I would just put the iPad simultaneously, you know, uh, playing the sound to the microphone. So anyways, um, if you're looking to jailbreak an iPad 2, you're not in luck. Now, if you have the uh, prior iPad, you can jailbreak it using different methods that still work. But I think they're... They're tethered jailbreaks if you want to do it on uh, iOS 5. So anyways, I'll have that link in the show notes for this podcast. Um, but right now, there is no jailbreak for the iPad 2 running iOS 5. 
Okay, uh, something else happened this week, which is on the uh, 18th. Apple announced its quarterly results for the fiscal quarter ending September 2011. Now, there was a little bit of a disappointment because it was the first time in a long time Apple did not meet uh, analyst expectations for the quarter. Uh, analyst expectations for the quarter in terms of revenue and profit were actually higher than the expectations that Apple made for the quarter. Apple did meet its own estimates for the fiscal quarter, beating them handily. But Apple felt a little short. And Apple felt a little short because, you know, the iPhone upgrade was delayed from June till October. So normally, um, in, in this quarter, like, the, like last year, you'd have a brand new iPhone to start off July uh, and August and September. And this year, there was no new iPhone. And so apparently, the sales were not... Um, as high as analysts expected. Obviously, the sales of the iPhone are going to be zooming now in October, November, December, because we have the new iPhone 4S. But the iPad sold really well. Apple sold, in those three months, 11.12 million iPads. So think about that. That's in one quarter. In three months, Apple sold 11 million iPads. Now, you know, at that rate, Apple could easily sell 40 million iPads in a year. That's a tremendous amount. Apple said that uh, the 11.12 million iPads it sold in the quarter was a 166% unit increase over the year ago quarter. So I think iPad sales are just going to continue to grow enormously, particularly in the fourth quarter. People are going to be giving the iPad left and right for Christmas and the holiday season. So I wouldn't be surprised if the figure is even, isn't even higher for the, for the quarter ending in December. Okay, let's talk about some new apps that came out for the iPad. One new app that looks really intriguing and um, a number of people have said have d has done the design very well and it's free is called the .NET Magazine uh, for the iPad uh, by Future Pick, And basically it's a free app, but of course there's in-app purchases. The November issue costs $6.99. The October issue $6.99. A subscription yearly, I guess, is um, $64.99. Um, and here's the description. It looks it's a very handsome a handsome um I guess magazine app for the iPad. It says .net is the world's best-selling magazine for web designers and developers. Every issue boasts pages of tutorials covering topics such as CSS, PHP, Flash, JavaScript, HTML5 and web web, web graphics written by many of the world's most re what respected web designers and creative design agencies interviewers features and it includes interviews features and pro tips also offers advice on uh, search engine optimization social media marketing web hosting the cloud mobile development and apps making it the essential guide for practical web design and it goes on to say the digital edition includes a link to web hosted items integral to the magazine's content it is not printable and does not include the cover mount items or supplements you would find with a printed copies. Huh. So, so basically, a one-year subscription is $64.99. A six-month subscription is $34.99. And a three-month subscription is $20.99. And, you know, it looks very handsome. It looks like a nice you know, magazine for the iPad. And so if you're into web development and you carry an iPad, it's probably worth getting this .NET iPad magazine. Okay, and another free app that you should probably get for the iPad is the 500px or Pixel 100 500px app, which is free um, and is getting decent ratings. And basically, you know, it's a photo, 
a gallery app and has beautiful photos. So here's what it says, the description. The official iPad app for 500px is here. Enjoy the world's best photos right at your fingertips. Discover exhilarating landscapes, cutest moments of wildlife, striking portraits, and more. Use your iPad as a photo frame to show amazing photos with music from your iTunes library. With the 500px account, you can elegantly showcase your photos, create slideshows, browse your, your friends' photos, and your favorites. So basically, you can browse popular editor choice, up and coming, and fresh photo streams. Photo change in photos change in real time. You can um, log in with your 500px account to see your photos, your friends' photos, and your favorites. And you can create a slideshow music, and you can share photos on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr or via email. So look, if you use something other than Flickr, it looks like the fee, the 500px uh, is, you know, is a is a great website for hosting your own photos, but also for seeing other great photos. So it's sort of like a rival to Flickr. Um, it says some of the upcoming features include video photo description, EXIF information and location, browse portfolios of your favorite photographers, browse photos based on specific categories, and you can sign up for an account inside the app, so they haven't done that yet. And, um, you know, it looks like a very handsome photo app, and uh, if you're into photography and um, want to try, I guess, a, a new you know, or a different um, source of photos other than Flickr, you should probably check it out. Just go to, um, if you, you know, if you go to 500px.com iPad, um, you know, it gives you an overview of the app. But what is 500? And, um, you know, it's basically this gorgeous photo website that has just like, you know, really beautiful photos. So, um, um, you know, you should check it out. I know I'm going to. Okay, another free app that you should definitely check out is from Adobe. You know, Adobe has long been a sort of rival and antagonist of Apple, complaining that Apple doesn't have Flash on the iPad. And the Adobe Reader is, I guess, the ultimate app for dealing with PDF content. And it's free. Remember, Adobe Reader is sort of ubiquitous on computers, and now it's coming to the iPad. And here is the description. Adobe Reader is the free global standard for reliably viewing and sharing PDF documents across platforms and devices easily and efficiently access the widest range of PDF file types, including PDF portfolios, password-protected PDF documents, and Adobe Live Cycle Rights Managed PDF, now available for the iPad, iPhone, and iPod Touch. And it says here you can open PDF files from email, the web, or any application that supports OpenIn. So you know that OpenIn feature when uh, you get a PDF by email, you can open it in iBooks or certain other programs. Well, now you can open it in Adobe Reader. You can, I guess, the the big advantage with this app is you can, to the extent there are sort of tricky PDFs, you know, particularly the password protected ones. Um, this app looks like it will. Um, handle it. It says here you can view PDF portfolios, PDF packages, annotations, and drawing markups. You can read text an an annotations such as sticky notes. You can access encrypted PDF files, open and view password protected PDF files. So that's key. Uh, and you can interact with the PDF files. It says you can search text to find specific information. You can use the bookmarks to jump directly to a section in your PDF file, you can select single page or continuous scroll modes, uh, and you can print and and you know email the PDFs. So I wonder if they're going to come out with like a professional version of Adobe uh, for the iPad, where you can do things like annotate, markup, um, PDFs 
even convert PDFs. That'd be kind of cool. Um, you know, converting, let's say, a PDF to uh, a PDF A standard. So, anyways, it's a free app. Uh, Adobe now has a number of apps uh, in um, in the App Store. Um, yeah, look, look over here. It's got one called Adobe uh, Create PDF. Um, and I hadn't seen this before, but it basically allows you to convert Word, Excel, and PowerPoint files into PDF documents in your iPhone, and that costs $10. So anyways, Adobe seems to be creating a, a lot of iPad apps. Uh, I guess it figures if you can't beat them, join them. So check it out. Now a very whimsical app that's free um, that's actually high up in the rankings in the iTunes store is the Talking Tom and Ben News for iPad app by something called Outfit 7. And here's the description. Talking Tom and Ben have become famous TV news anchors. So basically they're this animated cat and dog. And you can talk to them and they will repeat what you say in, in turns. So you can create and record funny conversations between them. You can also customize the app by uploading your personal videos. Just press the TV button in the app to record a video with the camera or choose one of your existing videos from your photos gallery. Once your personal video is in the app, make Tom and Ben comment on the video. And of course you can record the conversation and send the video to all your friends to see. So it's a, it's a sort of goofy, playful, you know, news joking app and so this is how you play talk to Tom and Ben and they will repeat in turns poke Tom and Ben to make them fall off their chairs swipe Tom and Ben to make them swivel around in their chairs press the dog paw button and Ben will annoy Tom with a boxing glove gun uh, or a toy dart gun press the cat paw button and Tom will annoy Ben with a water pistol air horn or a toy blowgun you have to upgrade the app to get these animations. So there are in-app purchases of, you know, it looks like there's one for $2.99. So they get you by, you know, paying for extra features. Um, you can press the TV button to customize the videos that are being played on the TV. Record the videos yourself with the camera or choose one of your existing videos. So, you know, this is highly amusing stuff. This is, you know, great to show at parties or if you've got kids, you know, it's something to play with. It's free. It's highly popular and it looks like it's somewhat addictive. And um, I think, you know, I think people should up download this because it's, it's definitely clever and innovative. Now, in the higher end of prices for apps on the iPad, uh, TomTom USA has finally released an iPad optimized app. Now TomTom Tom USA is of course the uh, navigation you know app that comes from the G GPS device manufacturer TomTom Tom. and the key is they now have a version 1.9 which is optimized for iPad. It says make the most of your iPad with a full screen display that shows you driving view and advanced lane guidance images at the same time. Purchase connected services in app or easily transfer your existing subscription. Cellular connection required when you want to go bigger. Move your TomTom Tom app to iPad. And, um, you know, this is something that I've always wanted to do. I have an iPad 2 with 3G. And I do think when you're driving, it's, it, you know, if you have your iPad 2 mounted and you have like a great navigation app, it's much better than having like an iPhone and um, it looks really kind of cool and there are in-app purchases um, you can add different voices for like I guess six dollars so it's kind of expensive um, it looks like a you know uh, th the forty nine dollars and ninety nine version will give you I guess all the um, all the 
maps in the United States. So look, if you plan to use your iPad to navigate a lot while you drive, you know, it might be worth it uh, to get this um, this forty nine dollar um, forty nine dollar um, iPad navigation app. So check it out. Okay, so one of the cooler gadgets that I've seen, um, I read about on broadbandtvnews.com, an article that came out on October 18th by Robert Briel. Now, apparently this device is only, I think, being sold in Europe. It's by Elgato, and apparently it's selling out like crazy. It says here, due to very high demand, the new ITV mobile for iPad 2 ran out of stock just days after its release. And basically, it's a tiny device which you plug into the USB section, and it has like an antenna, and it allows you to watch over-the-air TV, live TV on the iPad. And it works only with free-to-air DVB-T MPEG-2 signals, which include Freeview in the United Kingdom, TNT in France, and Uberball, Frensum in Germany, uh, and other channels in Europe. And basically, it, um, it connects directly to the dock connector and receives the television signature from a miniature telescope aerial. And uh, it says it's 99.95 euros, which is like over $100. Uh, now, that would be kind of cool in the United States. I mean, it'd be great if you could turn your iPad 2 into like a TV, like a roaming TV. Uh, and get high definition signals over the airway. So maybe Elgato will be bringing this to the United States. But to me, this is one of the cleverest little gadgets to work with the iPad. And, um, you know, I think um, if you're in Europe, you should definitely try to get one of these Elgato, uh, Elgato um, TV receivers for the iPad too. Very cool. Now, if you're looking for a cool gaming app for the iPad 2, or iPhone for us that really takes advantage of the hardware in the iPad 2 or the iPhone 4S which uses the dual core processor you might want to check out this cool app called Galaxy on Fire 2 HD and basically it's a saga science fiction game app and basically it says this is an epic award-winning saga that set the standard for sci-fi on the App Store and now it blazes onto the iPad 2 and iPhone 4S and Galaxy on Fire 2 HD so it's called Galaxy on Fire 2 HD and um, it says it has a App Store rating of 5 and a Metacritic score of 90 and basically, it's the story is a hyperdrive mal malfunction sends intergalactic adventurer and war hero Keith Maxwell tumbling through space and time, awakening 35 years later in the far end of the galaxy. He quickly finds himself fighting for his life against a mysterious alien armada that is wrecking havoc, wreaking havoc on the warring races occupying this volatile sector of space. And the gameplay, it says, you follow the rich and engrossing storyline through a fully 3D war-torn galaxy with over 10 hours of action-packed gameplay or head off on interplanetary journey of your own design. Uh, mining asteroids, trading ore and supplies, taking on mercenary missions, working as a pirate, and manufacturing new weapons and equipment as you seek adventures and excitement on the final frontier. So if you know it this might be good for kids to really get a sense of space it says um you can it has a, among its features a vast living galaxy with over 20 solar systems dozens of beautifully rendered planets 100 unique 3D space stations um so it looks really cool um it's 10 bucks and it looks like it's gotten lots of good reviews and, um, you know, it has beautiful sort of graphics. So for 10 bucks, um, I think it's probably 
you know, if you're looking for a new game that's very rich and sci-fi-ish, um, this Galaxy on Fire 2 HD game seems to be a good fit. Now, I will warn you, it's pretty massive. All the good games are pretty massive. This one, the, the file size is 275 megabytes. So if you only have, you know, the smallest iPad, you, you might want to hesitate. But, um, you know, it looks like a really cool, cool gaming app. Okay, so that's it for episode 77 of the iPad podcast. Uh, today is October 23rd, 2011. Remember, this is a chit-chat-free podcast. Any positive feedback that you can give on uh, iTunes for the uh, iPad podcast or in um, or on YouTube or on Blip TV would be greatly appreciated. So remember, buy your Steve Jobs biography tomorrow and see you next week. This has been a Max Future Production.